appropriate background, which you'll learn about more uh, as we dig into Matt's presentation uh, of the London Docks. But uh, that is the, su the subject of today's live stream, uh, London, the London Docks and British Empire Rum. Um, Matt, I know you have done a lot of fascinating research on this topic, so I'm, I'm really excited to, to learn more about it myself today. Um, before we get started, I do want to point out to everyone, I see we already have people using the chat box, letting us know where they're tuning in from. We've got Brussels, Coventry, Toronto, Virginia, so already all over the world. That's really cool to see. So um, yeah, feel free to say hello over there in the chat box. Um, also, there is a question box at the bottom of the screen. So if you have any questions that come up throughout the presentation format, um, just submit them to, to us there. I will be keeping an eye on those. And uh, we may we may answer some throughout the presentation if they're relevant, um, if they're you know relevant but not related to what we're talking about in the moment. Uh, there will be a portion for Q and A at the end. So, just any questions that come to mind, send them to us there. I'll be keeping an eye on those. Um, and also, uh, please share this event with your friends. Invite them to come tune in with us now. There's a share button at the top right of your screen. Um, you can share it on Facebook, Twitter, send it to people directly. Um, get some more people to come hang out with us. Uh, we're gonna have fun today. So, all right, all that said, uh, Matt, I wanna turn things over to you. And, and first of all, I think a, a, a good question to ask is probably like, um, obviously there are a lot of topics we can talk about in rum. Um, what made you want to talk about this one today? Yeah, uh, so th thank you all. I'm glad to be doing this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this has sort of taken over my life over the last uh, 18 months or so um, after, uh, my wife, Terry, and I both sort of pulled a ripcord on our normal, you know, careers <laughs> and decided to go chase our dreams. Uh, I was a little bit, a couple of months into uh, writing what is now Minimalist Tiki uh, when I got an email from Alexander Gabriel Plantation Rum. Mm -hmm. and he said, <clears throat> basically said, you know, we, ha we have a project, we, you, know, you know, would you be interested in doing? And it was essentially to to basically dig in and go back to the original sources and understand what, you know, all about of that, that sort of that era of British rum from, you know, British and British colonial rum, uh, you know, which would be London dock rum, but also Navy rum. And, you know, I've, I've already, we've already done some things about Navy rum. Um, I've done some things in uh, various online things here. I've done things with like Mitch Wilson. I have another one on Navy rum I'll be doing with, <clears throat> plantation, uh, I think in a four or five days, uh, but, but, but yeah, but it's sort of like people, people tend to fixate on the Navy room part. It's just, mm -hmm. just, you know, it's interesting. There's all this lore, but you know, without, without London dock rooms and without the infrastructure, uh, that, you know, the, the British had, uh, from the basically the 1800s on, we wouldn't like Navy rum probably wouldn't exist in the same way. So I sort of, I sort of think of them as like, it's like a common brain or common trunk of a tree. <clears throat> and that, you know, Navy rum went off on one side and, and London dock rum or consumer rum went off on the other, but they have a sort of, sort of core common uh, basis, which we'll talk about in a moment. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of people like hear those two terms and they just kind of think of them as the same thing. Like right. I know for me personally, that's for a long time. I just heard, oh, London Dock Round, Navy Round, like it's all it's all pretty much the same, right? Yeah, exactly. And they're and they're not. Um, they 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 sort of again they come from the same uh, trunk of the tree, but not they're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, and furthermore, it doesn't help matters or didn't help matters. I would say that. That in the you know we'll talk about this at the end, but <clears throat> the the end of that the era of the Zelanda Dock era, they were the brands like Lemon Heart, for example, were selling what they were labeling as needy rum. But you know if you look at the history, they were like they were they were you know perfectly fine dock rums, but they were not blended and created in the Navy. You know the right. way the Navy actually did. So in that sense, the brands actually sort of created that that confusion. And that conflation. So I, I think you may have a few brands associated with Navy Rum and and London Dock Rum behind you, right? Yes, I do. Yes, I'm gonna I'm yeah, gonna right, enlarge right, you so everyone there. can see that yeah. back there. Yeah, we have Lemon Heart Woods Lambs. More Lemon Heart there. Um, <clears> we'll, <throat> we'll, see more, we'll see more of these in a bit. Uh, but yeah, so to go back to this project, uh, we did it. Um, uh, Terry and I. Uh, we went off to London. We visited British National Archives and the Port of London Authority. Uh, the Naval Museum in Greenwich, um, some very, like four or five, well, probably four or five archives in total, 
uh, in a bit, you'll see some of the pictures that I personally, you know, found in the archives uh, that I brought back. Um, but yeah, so I did, I did the project. I wrote, you know, I wrote basically it's a it's a book that uh, I gave back to Plantation Rum there you know, in the process of editing it and laying it out and, you know, someday, you know, soon, hopefully it will appear as a book, but I sort of put that project aside from the perspective of like, I'm done. I've, you know, you know, we were all happy with how it came out, but my, my passion has continued. So, uh, I still to this day, you know, will spend time, you know, upstairs going through the, through the, the newspaper archives and, and old text, trying to sort of, you know, further reveal, uh, what actually was was going on there? <clears throat> so you know, it's sort of it's almost like my 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 happy fun time project is <laughs> you know it's it's become an, you know an obsession for me. So uh -huh. so yeah, so um so that's that's where this all came about. Um, like you said, you'll see it at some point in print eventually. But uh, you know, I've also taken some of that work and part of incorporating it into some of my writings. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I did a, recently did a, a blog post on how uh, there really wasn't a whole lot of Jamaican rum, if, if any Jamaican rum, for the last hundred or so years of of, uh, of Navy, the Navy rum story. So all that research is, is valuable in, in other dimensions as well. And you'll start seeing that I'm sort of doing more as I write about a country. Uh, you know, I now have a better sense of the history of that country and how it came to be where it is today. You know, Grenada, Guyana, you know, Jamaica, you know, this all sort of ties in together um, and incorporates even some other writings that aren't about, you know, that era. So, so cool. So that's where that's that's sort of the background here. Um, let's jump into the slides. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So uh, this is me. My name is Matt Petrick, obviously. Cocktail Wonk, my, my contact information there. Next slide. Okay. So here's what we're going to talk about uh, in very um, broad strokes. Um, first, you know, the British Empire, like what was it? How, how did it relate to rum and sugar? Things like that. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, Rust in, the, the West India Docks and rum tea. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the rum itself. Like what, what was that rum? Uh, who brought that rum in? And then we'll wrap up with um, <clears throat> sort of what happened out there? Where do we see it today? So, okay. So the British Empire and the Caribbean, um, basically, and you know, some people might quibble with these dates, but basically uh, I like to think of it as around 1640 to 1980. Uh, the 1640 date should be familiar to a lot of uh, rum enthusiasts. That's about when uh, Barbados started distilling rum. The the um, the uh, Portuguese, I think it was, brought over the, the sugarcane distilling technology from Brazil um, around that era, some say 1637. But basically, <clears throat> we had we had rum on a on a British colony, Barbados, uh, around 1640. And uh, you see that list on the left there, every one of those at some point, you know, Antigua, Bahama, Barbados, Barbista, Marrera, blah, 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 blah. Every one of those at some point was under, under Caribbean, or I'm sorry, under British control, even mm. if potentially uh, a, you know, a very short while. So some people, you know, might think I'm, well, <laughs> I'm on crack by saying Guadalupe and Martinique. Uh, but if you go back to the early 1800s, I can show you uh, the reports and documents uh, that like parliamentary records where they list like how much how much sugar was made in each colony, how much rum was made in each colony. Um, the, the, those Guadalupe and Martinique appear in those in those records as, as being essentially British territory. <clears throat> so over, you know, over time. Um, from again, from around 1640 on, and Britain's role in the Caribbean grew and grew and grew, and, you, and they basically acquired more and more territory. Uh, I know it's a little hard for people to see, uh, but that map on the right is essentially a color-coded view of the like basically the various uh, European colonies in the Caribbean. You know, and the big the big players were you know the just are not coincidentally you know when we think of the colonial styles, the Spanish. The Spanish style, the English style, the, the French style; those were the big players in the Caribbean. Um, there were some some smaller, <clears throat> some of the other European politics, you know, uh, like for example, the Dutch, you know, had some colonies, uh, for example. But over time, you know, as history progressed from the 1700s to the 1800s, it sort of became 
the British, French, and the Spanish. The, the, the British held a lot of the islands, and in particular, those sort of ones over on the smaller ones over on the right. Uh, the French, the French, you know, however, never let go of, of uh, really let go of Martinique and Guadeloupe. In fact, those mm. they're still French, technically French territory. They are part of France today. They're not their own country. People don't realize that. Uh, and then, the, you know, the Spanish, well, they had uh, Puerto Rico and Cuba for a very long time. Uh, and then especially what they would call the Spanish main, which is sort of hard to see in the map there. But essentially, the, the from South America, you know, the, the coast of South America up into the uh, Central America, you know, I think countries like uh, uh, Venezuela and Colombia and and what is now Belize, uh, even <clears throat> even up to Mexico, those were essentially essentially the, the Spanish holdings in the region. And so, you know, it took a very you know over it was hundreds of years that the, the, that none of that was independent. They were all basically you know for lack of a, you know a better word, they were all basically the farmland of of the you know the European sea powers, and they you know they sort of were pretty ruthless about extracting as much much value out of these colonies as possible. Uh, that that they were you know again you look at the parliamentary records from, from Britain, and you'll see like every you know every year like here's here's a colony here's how much they made in this this and this here's how much they paid an excise tax. It was it was very much a. a you know, a business and, and like, let's, let's basically plunder these colonies for what we can get out of them. And they, they think so we're in no way like the vacations destinations that we think of, of many of them uh, today. So, so that, that sort of, you know, you have to understand that mindset uh, to really understand this history is that, you know, it was very much a colonial mindset that basically uh, every Island, every region was, was a colony of some European power. And of course, um, <clears throat> we started seeing, you know, the empire start, you know, British empire and even some of the other empires start to crumble uh, for the most part uh, by the mid, mid 1900s. I mean, obviously Haiti, Haiti became independent earlier. But by the mid 1900s, you started seeing the real decline of the, the British empire, basically uh, in the 60s, you know, Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, Guyana, uh, all gained their independence. They all went independent, uh, and it even went through to like I think Grenada was in 1973. I think there's I think Antigua. I forget like 1982. But essentially, that that sort of long arm of colonialism lasted for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So you know, and so it's only it's only recently in the last you know century or less that that. You know the independent countries of Jamaica, Barbados, you know, uh, and so on and so forth, still exist. Are, are are independent countries, and we still have some. You know, some are effectively still like territories of the you know the empire, the the European powers. You know, Martinique and Guadeloupe are part of France, and Puerto Rico is now part of the United States. Uh, Cuba was at once part of the United States. Um, I'm sorry, Cuba was on, yeah yeah. Yeah, Cuba was a part of the United States until, you know, it went through basically two or three revolutions. Uh, it wasn't until the 59 one that, that sort of like really got rid of a lot of the um, sort of the European or American influence on it. So, okay, next slide. Sugar and rum. Um, the, the colonies, and this is across all of the European powers, like the, the French, Spanish, and English, they were all at some point you know, sort of realized that, that that sugar grew really well in the Caribbean. And, you know, and it wasn't like the Caribbean, you know, the Caribbean countries and the, and the Spanish main countries, it wasn't like they all started planting sugar immediately. It sort of evolved over time and different, you know, depending on who their European um, master was, you know, they may, they may have come to it later. Uh, for example, the, um, the Spanish colonies were not allowed to actually make rum until around 1800 or so. Right. Uh, they didn't want it competing with Spanish goods, right? Exactly. And so mm -hmm. there, there's a reason, you know, the Santa Teresa is 1796, uh, the year that, that basically the Spanish proclamation uh, was essentially like allowed them to start making it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, so if you think about, well, gee, the, the Spanish territories weren't making rum until 1800. And then you realize that the British were making rum from about 1650. Like that's a 150 year head start. 
Right. Um, <clears throat> but they all, but they were all basically uh, making, you know, sugar was always the dominant crop. You know, if, if the island grew sugar, it was usually the biggest crop. And the, you know, sugar was much more valuable than the rum. The, you know, like, rum was like a nice to have. It was actually considered like, hey, a way to make a little extra money and actually offset some of the cost of running the plantation. Mm -hmm. But rarely, they were rarely going like, hey, we made this much money from sugar and this much money from rum. It was like, we made this much money from the sugar, you know, and like, you know, the rum or molasses sales <laughs> were again, were sort of like used to offset cost. So that was their attitude. That sugar, sugar was the big was the big player. And Matt, and, where did these illustrations come from? I'm curious. Yeah, these are from, and I I I, I came across these recently, and I started posting uh, posting at least one of them on the on the the Rum History Forum uh, mm -hmm. that, I, that I moderate. Uh, they are from a, an 1823 um, book. I forget. I'm trying. It's like it's like ten drawings on on the state of farming in Antigua. I forget the exact title. Uh, okay. I have it noted down somewhere, but it's essentially, it's, it's 10 drawings or 10 watercolors and they're, they're, you know, despite the subject, they're beautifully done. Um, <clears throat> and I've, you know, and, and I've, I've grabbed high resolution images of them, you know, keep in my archives. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially they, they show the progression over 10 images of the different parts of the, of the uh, basically the the rum and sugar making process, and you'll note, you know, basically the, the key thing that stands out here is that these were all slaves that they right. the workforce. What made rum and sugar production in the Caribbean uh, economically viable <clears throat> was they got basically they had very inexpensive labor uh, in the form of, of slaves um, brought over primarily from Africa. And you can see from these images that it was just brutal conditions. And you can, right. it's, it's heartbreaking to see these images um, and that, that, you know, that that's what it is. And we can't ignore what happened. And <clears throat> slavery was a, was a, a very big part of the early economic um, history of Caribbean rum and sugar. Now, you know, these pictures from are, are from around 1823. Uh, it was only 10 years later that Britain themselves said, well, okay, we're going to abolish slavery. Mm -hmm. okay, no more slavery after 1834. However, in 1834, the slaves would then go through a four-year period of, of essentially apprenticeship, uh, for lack of a better word. It's essentially getting another, a way of getting four more years of basically almost free labor out of the slave. Right. Uh, but then by 1838, Essentially, okay, you know, you couldn't legally allow leave to have slaves. Now, <clears throat> when slavery ended, I will say it's very important to note that the British government did pay reparations. Oh, interesting. They paid reparations not to the slaves, they paid reparations to the slave owners. Ah, okay. That's an important distinction. Yeah, it's a very important distinction. Basically, you know, the the West India merchants, who we'll talk about in, in a little bit later, uh, they were basically like slaves were their property, and the government came along and said, you know, this is no longer your property, and so okay, yes, we'll pay you for the loss of your property. Um, no, no money to the slaves, but right. but you know, the the I forget what the amount to, the amount per slave was, but some some of the large estate owners, you know, the 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 um, people like the Hibberts, for example, who own multiple Caribbeans and thousands of slaves, they made a substantial amount of money uh, when <clears throat> when slavery ended. Um, so again, I mean, it's just sort of horrifying when you think about it now. Yeah. But that's what happened. Uh, and then, so so what happened after 1838? Um, well, that's when we get into. Uh, we're not ready for that slide. 1838. <laughs> that's when that's when we get into indentured servants, uh, indentured servitude, where they basically the government said, okay, fine, we can't have slaves, okay, fine, we'll, we'll have workers and we'll pay them. Um, but essentially, so essentially what they did is they started, uh, they basically contracted out to the, to uh, Southeast Asia, like the, um, you know, primarily India, and, mm. and, but also like China, Basically saying, okay, you know, to, you know, to a to a person there, you know, a young person primarily, like, you know, we'll pay for you to come over to the Caribbean and work in the plantations, and you know, you you'll sign a contract and you will do it for seven years, 
at the end of seven years, like we'll give you a passage back or you can stay. Um, <clears throat> but essentially it was, it was, is essentially not much of a step up above slavery in terms of conditions. It just, you know, you didn't legally own the slaves anymore, but the conditions were still pretty horrible. Right. But if you, you know, if you look, you know, different, I mean, different Caribbean countries have, you know, sort of have each have their own sort of like ethnographic makeup. But for example, if you look at uh, Guyana, for example, there's a an enormous, I think the, the largest population segment in Guyana is, is uh, of Indian. Mm -hmm. That's those are all basically the descendants of the indentured servants who who came over from about 1838 uh, through I think it was around 1917 or so. But essentially, you know, slavery under a different name uh, continued uh, right until yeah. you know, in the in in the chat, Dwayne Stewart uh, chimed in and said, "Don't forget the indentured uh, worker period, which is often passed over." Right. <clears throat> yeah. And so, and so, and what we're just there, I've just described, you know, basically the British, the British version of it, but, you know, the Spanish and the French went through any you know, of the same thing. It's like, it's, it's, uh, I haven't studied the Spanish and French uh, as much in this context, but I mean, my recollection is that they all eventually ended slavery and sort of all went through this phase mm. um, of, of essentially, um, gee, we don't have cheap labor anymore. And, um, and with with the demise of slavery and now when now workers having to uh, be paid, the the economics of the sugar and the rum industry changed dramatically from about 1840 on, and the sugar uh, industry just went through very tough times. Basically, like suddenly it costs a lot more, and you know, and it's like you know, it's like imagine that, right? Yeah, cry, cry them a river because the right. <clears throat> point is, is like it costs more. You know, and so rum from about 1840 on, you know, went through some very hard times, just just like in terms of economics only, very hard mm -hmm. time. And uh, you know, many estates started closing. That and and in particular, it was hit with a double whammy of you know, the rise of beet sugar. Is that uh, Napoleon and France uh, started creating sugar, you know, on the continent from beets, and suddenly we don't need we don't need the sugar coming from the Caribbean. Yeah. Know? The price, you know, sugar prices drop. Just you know, it's like there's less demand for it. Sugar prices drop, and and again, sugar was always the dominant player, and rum sort of like is a follow-on. So if, if the states aren't making sugar, they aren't making rum, and so it was, a, it was a very dark time for you know, I mean, not only from the slavery perspective, but also from the just the sugar and the rum industry staying viable. Um, there was a fantastic. Uh, document written in 1897. It's called the the, the West India Royal Commission, which mm. was basically the British government sending out an emissary, you know, group of emissaries to go interview people on in all the islands and say like, what the hell is going on here? Why are we not making the money we used to? You know, and and you know, one of the one of the things that the, the landowners, you know, the estate owners were saying is like oh, you're taxing the hell out of us among other things mm. you know, and we're facing this you know insane competition uh, from beet sugar but also from sugar elsewhere in the world so it was you know you know 18 you know late 1800s early 1900s was a brutally tough time uh to be in the rum market so i mean this is all important to sort of set to set the stage for that sort of colonial era era of the caribbean so now we can go to the next slide all right <clears throat> okay